appreciate his participation. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome aboard. The session is being recorded. You'll be on mute during the webinar. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function and we'll answer as many of them as we can in the time we have allowed. We usually take about 40 minutes total, um, saving about 10 minutes for questions. We try to answer all of them in writing after the webinar, uh, including those that are submitted and we don't have time to answer during the live session. We also post our recording on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to find access to that via our website and also on WorkCare at YouTube. Let me turn it over to our speaker, Anthony Harris, MD, MPH, MBA. Dr. Harris is board certified in occupational medicine. He's our chief innovation officer and associate medical director for on-site clinical operations. He's also our lead clinician for WorkCare's COVID-19 response. Dr. Harris, thanks again for being here. Excellent. Thank you, Karen, and thanks everyone for joining us once again. Excited to uh, bring to you today a perspective from a global look. So we're going to zoom out, look at the global macro uh, influencers on what's happening here in the U.S. Uh, we're going to learn. The goal is to learn from what's happening globally, look at global data, and, and really do a good job of understanding here in the U.S., are we faring okay? Are we following what trends are existing uh, in other nations? Or are we off the mark, right? Um, and the overall uh, perspective we wanna gain is to understand where we're heading, right? Are we spiraling down, uh, spiraling out of control with regard to the impact to, uh, uh, of COVID-19 to our workforce? Or are we uh, doing as uh, others are uh, faring and, and certainly in the news, you're seeing a lot of uh, global uh, influencers pop up. And so we obviously won't be able to get to all of those influencers. So please do uh, uh, fill up our uh, question bank here so we can address those for you afterwards. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into today's presentation. Uh, if you're familiar with our presentations, we'll cover the clinical update followed by the microbiology pathology. Uh, we'll talk about the epidemiology as it stands in the U.S. and then we'll get into the global perspective uh, with some of our uh, aspects of prevention and look at specifically uh, briefly in this case uh, what the workforce strategy should be as we focus in on uh, again how do we prevent uh, illness in the workplace, transmission in the workplace. So zooming into the clinical, there's not a whole lot of uh, new clinical presentations that we haven't spoken about. Obviously, we've touched on the mental health impacts. We've touched on uh, the younger population being perhaps more susceptible to neurologic uh, deficits as a result of COVID-19. Uh, and we're seeing that anecdotally here at WorkCare uh, amongst some of the workforce and the fogginess um, that is described thereof from the neurologic impact in the younger folks. So let's look at then um, a update of what we're seeing proportionally uh, to the uh, people affected by COVID-19. And this is perhaps the largest um, uh, body of data that looked at over 370,000 cases reported to CDC. And this was during the month uh, from January till May. Uh, and we examined in this study the uh, top uh, presentations from a clinical perspective. We've touched on this before, way back when, uh, several times. But we want to update in terms of over time, have we seen changes here, shifts here? So above and uh, far and away, fever, cough, and shortness of breath is still number one. Uh, we haven't seen a change there. Fever defined as, in this case, 100.4, also defined and, and captured in that fever is a subjective fever. So that's important to point out in terms of criteria. And certainly when we're talking about screening from a symptomatic standpoint, uh, subjective fevers, if not measured, uh, should be a part of your regimen in terms of flagging workers, keeping them out of the workplace, and making sure they have uh, we do our due diligence with regard to their risk of having COVID uh, 
uh, shortness of breath and cough are followed by myalgia, and then it goes down, continues to go down from there with uh, headaches still being prominent uh, amongst those affected. So we'll continue to watch this from time to time, but we wanna understand, are we seeing shifts in presentations uh, from a clinical perspective? And we touched on the underlying, uh, it, the, the underlying pathology in that with regard to the virus mutations from a drift standpoint uh, and a shift standpoint, genetic drift and genetic shift uh, impacting how it affects individuals. So again, we'll touch on this from time to time just to keep everybody abreast uh, of these symptoms. As we look at then uh, the pathology update, we wanted to revisit this briefly, just in case you missed it last week when we talked about uh, the likelihood of a vaccine being available from a timing perspective in the US mid-May of next year is our prediction here based upon historic trends of vaccine distribution in the US specifically. Now, obviously there's gonna be some global factors that affect this and we'll touch on those here momentarily. Uh, if we look at updating you on the top uh, leading uh, uh, vaccine potentials that are in phase three trial, we see that number growing still in terms of number of uh, uh, candidates in phase three uh, uh, studies. Unfortunately, we're seeing also at that same time some uh, additional uh, studies being halted, in this case, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and if we look at Johnson & Johnson's uh, um, uh, announcement that just came yesterday, they temporarily paused uh, their vaccine candidate um, in, in, in it's called the phase three ensemble trial uh, due to illness, uh, and in this case, a severe illness in one of their study participants. Uh, they have not disclosed what type of illness, the severity, uh, um, uh, specifics around that illness, but it obviously was enough to prompt them to halt their uh, study. And, and so it's uh, yet to be determined when they're going to revisit restarting the study. It probably won't be until uh, late October when the safety board uh, and group that they put together will review the clinical data again and make a determination of next steps. So we see another vaccine uh, that has been halted. We talked about Moderma. Um, impacts there from uh, and uh, AstraZeneca halting theirs and we'll continue to provide you updates here both locally and globally in terms of uh, success uh, uh, and failures of vaccines as they come. We mentioned last week what President Trump received uh, to clarify that it was a antibody cocktail from this company called uh, Regeneron and we touched on specifics about how that antibody cocktail uh, was manufactured and, and, and the extent thereof. We mentioned this again today because we want to talk about what happened at Eli Lilly here uh, just this week as well. So Eli Lilly um, uh, paused their trial for uh, their uh, antibody cocktail that they were providing and studying in, non, in, in hospitalized individuals, okay? So uh, Regeneron's solution that Dr. Uh, President Trump received was intend is intended for uh, non-hospitalized individuals and they have applied since uh, for emergency uh, use authorization. So too was Eli Lilly heading in that direction uh, and is uh, anticipating uh, in the midst of this halt still moving forward with the emergency use authorization for non-hospitalized utilization. In this case, they halted their uh, study uh, in 326 uh, individuals um, because of adverse uh, uh, clinical, uh, basically metrics that they were seeing uh, when they were administering these antibodies to these individuals that were hospitalized. So again, the biggest difference is uh, that they gave this cocktail to hospitalized individual patients uh, in, in the order of seven times the amount they would recommend for non-hospitalized individuals. So that's what they've halted. They're still moving forward with emergency use authorization for non-hospitalized individuals because the dosage is seven times less 
than what they were doing in this particular study. So we'll continue to see uh, and follow whether or not they receive that authorization uh, for this particular cocktail. Uh, and so when we talk about then uh, the happenings from a global perspective and the impact and influence um, that we're seeing here in the US, we know that uh, Russia just yesterday announced uh, that they have approved, quote unquote, another vaccine for utilization uh, to the general public. Now, let's dig into that. Let's dig into that influence. What does that mean? How come we're behind the eight ball in the US if Russia's already approving um, a, a, a use of vaccines uh, broadly there? And if we look at the first approval of uh, their vaccine uh, and what the clinical community and scientific community thought of that, uh, the first vaccine was uh, from Russia called Sputnik V was approved um, back in August, okay? And they became the first country to approve a vaccine. Now, if we dig into that, uh, what that means, we can see that the clinical community, scientific community uh, stood back and, and uh, uh, took a uh, question to this particular approval, specifically from Brown University saying, we have no idea whether the vaccine is safe or whether it works. Uh, this was the Dean of Brown University. Uh, and so uh, the reason behind that is because Russia has approved these vaccines uh, from a political play. And when I say political, um, it's specific to their approval process and it not being followed uh, in, the, in that country uh, for approval. So Sputnik V um, uh, was the first vaccine approved, tested only on a limited number of people, um, and it was only in phase one and phase two clinical trials. Although those individuals, 100 number, uh, were doing okay, we had no data as to the safety of this particular um, uh, uh, anti, uh, excuse me, vaccine, okay? And so we see the same thing play out in their second uh, approval here from Vector Labs. Uh, and they're not expecting to do a phase three clinical trial and have that data available until November, or December of this year. So this uh, tells us specifically uh, when we look at Sputnik and we look at um, the vector vaccine, uh, we, we look at then a process that has circumvented the normal uh, approval process of vaccinations in Russia and was uh, granted uh, utilization from the Kremlin. Uh, and uh, that has now become what we're going to watch in terms of are there individuals becoming sick as we see phase three clinical trials proceed? Uh, so influencing the U.S. and influencing other countries uh, to utilize this particular vaccine, yeah, there's influence and countries have uh, pre-ordered this vaccine, but uh, all of them to, is what we see. All of those countries are still awaiting uh, phase three clinical uh, data before administering uh, in the general public, as to uh, it looks like Russia is. Uh, if we look at other vaccines that are available globally and looking at where they are in the approval process, uh, specifically we'll point out uh, two vaccines in China. Uh, again, China being another country in, in which we've seen administration of vaccines. Um, as, as Sinovac was approved as well as uh, CanSino. Uh, CanSino was authorized for use to the uh, military of China, uh, and Sinovac uh, was cleared for frontline workers, uh, such as hospital workers, uh, doctors, uh, and officials, okay? Um, so those vaccines aren't being administered to the general public in China at this point, only to a select uh, a group of individuals, and phase three clinical trial is still ongoing. So in general, what we're seeing uh, across the board globally from a vaccine standpoint is there is no clear leader when it comes to understanding the safety uh, and, and efficacy of a vaccine at this point. Um, the US is faring okay in that regard. We're just not approving and utilizing vaccines um, because of unknown safety repercussions. So that's important to point out, and it's important to, add, important to add this, some of these details, again, not at the same level we're talking about today, 
but we need to communicate to the workforce that just because you're seeing um, in the news other countries utilizing vaccine, vaccines in this fashion, they're not doing so to the same safety level extent that we require here in the US. And that's a good thing, right? Because we have heard in the news uh, talking, talks of and growing population of people who are reluctant even when a vaccine is available to utilize it because of safety concerns. So if we're able to educate appropriately our workforce and give them more uh, knowledge around uh, where we stand in the U.S. versus other countries, we can do a better job of reassuring the U.S. public that once a vaccine is available, it is very likely to be very safe because the studies have been done and the approval came after these studies uh, were concluded. All right, so let's get into some of the epidemiology. We're gonna spend a lot of time doing epi today. Uh, we'll touch on what we typically touch on here uh, briefly, and we'll look at it a little differently uh, from the, and, and a little more succinctly, because we're gonna be revisiting some of these stats as we dig into the global uh, perspective here uh, of, of prevention. So in the US, we're up to seven, uh, almost 8 million, 7.7 7 million cases. And if we look at the cases um, on a seven day average um, per 100,000 individuals, we're at 15.2, okay? And if we look at total deaths, uh, 214,000 deaths. If we break that down into uh, the, the actual deaths per 100,000, we're at 0.2, okay? And we'll continue to look at deaths again as a, uh, albeit a lagging indicator, an important indicator as to how we're faring in the U.S. with regard to our dealing with COVID-19. If we look at uh, globally the total number of cases on a daily, a daily average, seven-day average here, uh, we're seeing India still uh, above the U.S., uh, followed by Brazil. Uh, this was two weeks ago. This is last week uh, and uh, continued to see an upward trend here in the U.S this week in terms of daily new confirmed cases. If we zoom into the deaths, uh, two weeks ago, we saw a flattening of that curve um, and it continuing to flatten last week and it continues to be flat this week. Again, we know that there's a 30 day lag in uh, the death rate uh, in regards to looking at the total number of cases uh, and, the number, and the growing number of deaths. So we will anticipate over the next couple of weeks to see an increase in that trajectory of deaths. Let's look at then the positive uh, tests that we're, uh, we've been tracking here over time, seven day rolling average. The US has not been faring well in this metric. We have been in an upward trend uh, for a couple weeks now, two weeks ago, uh, last week where we stood, and this week on that same trajectory upward trend, meaning that we're not likely articulating the impact of COVID um, as well as we could be. Obviously doing better than Mexico, Indonesia, South Africa, et cetera, um, but we still have some room to go and compare, uh, compared to uh, New Zealand and other countries um, that uh, specifically have a much more decreased rate of positive tests uh, that they're doing on a seven day rolling average. Uh, if we look at total number of tests, we saw um, that decline over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it started to peak up here a little bit two weeks ago uh, and decline again last week. Uh, we crested uh, for the first time this, uh, this for the first time here, right over a million. Um, and so that's a positive news this week in terms of total number of tests on a daily basis here. So we'll continue to watch this, uh, realizing that uh, we still need to increase the number of tests uh, performed in the U.S. So now let's keep the epidemiology hat on. Let's talk about uh, prevention here uh, in the terms of uh, tertiary prevention, meaning uh, what are the metrics or what, what do we need to pay attention to to help decrease morbidity, death, right? And, uh, excuse me, mortality, excuse me, and morbidity, uh, which is uh, a permanent uh, disease or permanent effects from disease. And then we're gonna look at what are the metrics important for secondary prevention, again, in the global perspective, uh, and looking at testing and uh, trying to prevent transmission after we have a positive case. And then uh, we'll look at primary prevention, where we wanna live primarily, right? 
uh, in terms of mitigating risk factors for transmission. And we're going to see how uh, countries are doing that. We're going to also compare that to how the U.S. is doing here uh, from an exposure prevention standpoint. And this is that continuum of uh, basically COVID performance indicators uh, that we all want to be well versed in so that, again, we have in place uh, these features uh, to help protect our workforce. So let's start with that tertiary prevention here. And let's look at then uh, the deaths per million uh, from a global perspective, zooming into North America so we can see specifically how the U.S. is doing in comparison, okay? Uh, and again, uh, when we look at deaths and the death, uh, total number of deaths, right, uh, we have to look at it in perspective of uh, population. It has to be population-based. Obviously, there are positives and negatives of looking at death rates and looking at the number of deaths uh, per, per, per um, uh, capita, right? Uh, we know deaths are a lagging indicator, uh, and so we'll, we'll take that perspective, but we'll also look at some of the positives in regards to looking at deaths. That being, if we look at the uh, uh, deaths that, uh, the variability of deaths, it's not as highly variable as if we look at total number of cases, right? Um, total number of cases is impacted um, by the uh, testing and the extent of testing in a particular country, meaning that the more you test, the more positive cases you're likely to find, as well as you're likely to see higher number of total cases. So looking at that specific, that metric in isolation, um, uh, it shows more variability than if we look at deaths, which is not as susceptible to uh, testing, right? Um, and so as we look at this metric, we can see that the U.S., uh, in terms of total number of deaths per million, uh, is still at the top of the heap in regards to impact from COVID-19, okay? And we can begin to see the doubling um, uh, doubling rate here as depicted in this chart. And we'll, we'll venture back to that in terms of that tertiary prevention, prevention of deaths. How well are we doing? Not that well here in the U.S. If we look at then uh, how rapidly deaths are increasing uh, across um, uh, multiple countries here, and we look more specifically at the doubling rate, okay, uh, of, death, uh, of the deaths, we can see again, U.S. is still very high in total number um, of, of, of deaths uh, per, uh, if we, we looked at it per million, right? Uh, and then we're going to also look at it uh, specific to the doubling time here. And so when we look at the doubling time uh, compared to the total confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million, uh, we can see if we zoom into the U.S. where we stand uh, and we are still um, uh, not faring uh, well because we want to see this uh, pushed out to the right, okay? The further out to the right, meaning the longer uh, it takes to double the number of deaths in a particular country, the better that country likely is controlling transmission of COVID-19, right? So we're doubling around every 200, uh, uh, if we're looking at days, right, daily periods here, uh, we're doubling every 200, and that's the number of deaths we're looking at specifically. Uh, and if we compare that globally, obviously we're high, much higher than many countries, right? And so when we talk about our, is the U.S. doing well with regard to controlling COVID-19, utilizing this metric, the answer is no. And we'll likely continue to see uh, increases in both rates of infection and, and deaths be, until we see this particular metric uh, start to move out to the right. Uh, and so as we look at then uh, another perspective of uh, uh, deaths in a particular country, we can look at excess mortality. I know we've touched on this in different charts previously, looking at state by state, excess mortality since uh, easing of and relaxing of uh, social distancing over time. Uh, but we're going to look at this holistically from country to country and track, you know, over time uh, where we stood with regard to the number of deaths from all causes uh, compared to this time during COVID. So put another way, this particular chart looks at a historic rate over a five-year period from 2015 to 2019, and that particular month's death, uh, average deaths, right, in that country, and compares that now to the average deaths, uh, number of deaths 
uh, in 2020 during COVID. And uh, for example, if we look at um, uh, Spain uh, depicted here and the US, right? But, but specifically looking at Spain, uh, they crested back in March over 100 here. I'm gonna use my laser pointer uh, just to, to, to point that out. And so 100% comparison um, from the five-year period till now represents a doubling of deaths, right, uh, in that country, COVID period compared to previous period. And obviously attributing that to COVID uh, is, is one of the inferences we can draw. Now, is it conclusive causality? No, obviously that uh, level of causality is going to uh, be played out over time and data from, for years to come, very likely. But what we're able to clearly see in terms of uh, um, uh, the association of COVID, uh, pre-COVID and, and comparison to COVID, we're seeing excess deaths in, in, in various countries, Spain. If we look at US, uh, we crushed it 40% uh, excess deaths uh, back in March. Uh, and we declined here. I'll, uh, let's actually play that forward. And you can see more specifically the US and how we fared with regard to excess deaths. Uh, and we're doing better according to this metric here as we look at excess deaths in the US. So we'll continue to watch this metric and see, uh, add that to the uh, mix of uh, answering the question, how are we doing here in the US with regard to our control of COVID-19 uh, and, and its spread. So let's get into some of the metrics that we want and data around secondary prevention. So we addressed the impact from a morbidity mortal or mortality standpoint. Let's address it from a transmission standpoint. And we're gonna look at then the number of tests as a metric per thousand people uh, globally, as well as in the US. And if we look at this metric, we can clearly see that the US is doing well from the uh, perspective of testing per thousand of our population, right? And that's what we want to see. Uh, and obviously, we still have some room to go in terms of our other metrics of performance. But according to this metric, we're doing okay. But if we look at then the number of tests for confirmed cases uh, in the US here, as well as globally, we fall in the uh, bottom third of this group of uh, selected countries that we're looking at here compared to New Zealand, which um, they're seeing in terms of total number of tests uh, for a confirmed case um, uh, out at 667, uh, it's only 16.6 .6 tests uh, necessary to find a confirmed case of COVID here in the US. So again, looking at this metric, we can ask the question, how are we doing with overall impact of COVID-19? And we're not doing that well uh, compared to other countries that have far less burden of illness. Uh, and, and again, this metric is impacted by the percent uh, or the rate of tests, right, uh, for the general population. Um, but certainly it is an important metric that we need to pay attention to, to help answer the question of, are we doing okay? Are we trending better? Are we gonna see things improve over time in terms of impact uh, to our workforce? If we look at this map that we haven't looked at, Oh, in probably two months now, uh, we used to look at it more frequently. We revisited today in terms of looking globally at the map of positive tests, um, uh, share of positive tests in that particular country. And if you re can recall, if you joined us previously, uh, where we stood months ago, we were in that three to 5% range. We had uh, vacillated up and down a little bit. Uh, and right now we still remain in the US in that range, three to 5% positive tests. Again, shifting towards the left of this particular uh, metric means that we have uh, better control potentially of COVID-19, having uh, uh, fewer case positive cases for the number of tests we're uh, conducting. It also may mean uh, shifting towards the left that we're better articulating the burden of illness uh, in that particular uh, region, okay? Obviously, we see uh, Australia doing well uh, with the percent of tests we, we've we seen in the media, probably uh, images of, uh, of soccer games, football games being uh, uh, with large groups of people uh, out and about in New Zealand uh, and their performance, their uh, well performance uh, in terms of controlling COVID-19 transmissions there. So we'll, we'll do some more comparisons here on the global scale to see and, and look at those countries reportedly doing well
and what metrics uh, they're performing well at. And so let's look at primary prevention now. Again, primary prevention being that we're gonna uh, look at how uh, uh, there are steps to mitigate um, transmission uh, and, and not just that secondary prevention of, you know, once you have a positive, how do you, how do you measure uh, prevention and transmission? How do we actually put in place measures to keep everyone safe before there's even any issues of positive cases, right? And so let's dig into those metrics. Um, uh, again, we looked at cases per million, right? Just briefly here um, to compare uh, Brazil, US and a couple other states, a couple other countries here uh, in terms of how, how we're doing overall per million, right? Uh, because the next metric we wanna look at then is the doubling time of those total cases, uh, confirmed cases. So again, we looked at doubling time of deaths when we talked about our performance from a tertiary prevention standpoint, when we're talking about primary prevention, we want to look at doubling time of cases, total confirmed cases, okay? And again, we know the uh, strengths and weaknesses of this particular metric as it pertains to the amount of testing that's uh, being conducted, um, but yet and still, it's important to examine this. And if we look at where the U.S. stands here, uh, we are um, in that doubling time again, around uh, over 100 days here uh, with this particular metric uh, up, up to date as of October 14th, okay? Um, and if we look at then our total number uh, of confirmed COVID cases per million, uh, again, we're in that uh, right around 25, uh, excuse me, um, 25,000, right under 25,000 uh, per million. Compared to other countries here that we've highlighted, uh, uh, Switzerland that has done better uh, is uh, further out on that doubling scale. Uh, we look at um, uh, Brazil, because we just compared ourselves to Brazil in that previous chart here. Uh, they're a little further out on the doubling scale. So we want to see this. We want to see ourselves uh, pushed out towards the right. That means we are doing better with regard to the impact of COVID and the spread and transmission of COVID uh, in the U.S. here, that primary prevention. If we look at another uh, metric here, let's look at workplace closures. Which countries required workplace closures? Um, other than key uh, workers, uh, which ones had no measures in place whatsoever. And if we uh, examine this briefly here, we can see that the majority of countries recommended some type of required workplace closure for their, their workforce, their, for their, work, uh, their general population, okay? Um, and so it's not just recommended, it's actually required. That's what you're seeing in that orange color there, peach orange color. Uh, versus required for all workers, uh, that was few and far between uh, in terms of the global um, uh, perspective. And we can see again those countries that have been hardest hit uh, and what they recommended. If we look at then those countries that are doing contact tracing, we looked at this metric uh, some months ago as well, and there are far fewer countries doing contact tracing than what we see now uh, today. But the majority of countries doing contact tracing um, uh, to, to its fullest extent in terms of comprehensive on all cases. Uh, and so that's an important uh, feature in terms of uh, a country's ability to articulate and prevent, uh, articulate illness and then prevent illness in a primary prevention fashion. And then let's look at restrictions on public gatherings. Um, and as we can see the different scale here at the bottom, we go from no restrictions to a thousand or less to a hundred to a thousand. 10 to 100 people and then less than uh, less than 10 people. And if we look at then uh, some countries that have done well, like Australia, um, that required less than 10 people, uh, that doesn't uh, compare to what we see play out in India that we know, where we know the impact has been far greater. Uh, if we look at the US, we had restrictions that varied from 10 to 100 people. And we obviously know where we stand uh, in comparison to other countries. One thing to note, however, and we talked about this before, one of the uh, strongest factors as, a re, uh, as, as it pertains to transmission and, and being uh, successful at primary prevention is population density, right? We know that the population density in India is an order of magnitude greater than Australia and New Zealand where the population density there is less than 15, as opposed to India where it's over 200 per square uh, uh, kilometer, right? And so uh, that is uh, something we can dig into a little bit uh, as we continue to talk about prevention in future presentations here. Uh, but we wanna talk about also uh, the government response. Now this is a, 
index that um, this particular body of data uh, and body of research came up with that looked at uh, a couple factors in that index, that government response stringency index. And that was school closures, workplace closures, uh, travel bans um, altogether in terms of um, the most strict response being 100 and zero being uh, no response at all. And as we look at then where the U.S. stands in terms of that strictness, we were uh, above the, the middle on uh, the median there, if you would, uh, at 60, just above 60, 65 roughly in that uh, particular metric. Um, and then we can look at then the bi-weekly bi growth in cases, right? So we, by this metric, are, are faring okay, right? We, we can see that the growth wasn't as rapid as other countries like Italy uh, and, uh, and, and Malaysia, et cetera. But we also can see that we weren't the most strict as well. And there's other countries that were more strict that may have fared better in terms of growth of cases. So again, the, the point of looking at all this global data uh, is to again, drive home, how are we doing in the US? Are we gonna fare uh, better? Are we gonna fare worse uh, in terms of impacts from COVID-19? Uh, and do we have the right uh, approach in regards to performance metrics of handling of COVID-19 from a tertiary, secondary, and primary preventative uh, strategy? Uh, and so we, we wanna see how this plays out uh, for us globally, uh, for us locally in the US. And then finally, we wanna see how it's gonna play out for us in terms of our workforce strategy and what do we need to pay attention to. And we'll be a little succinct here so we can open it up to questions today. Uh, but we just wanna reinforce the things to keep in mind. Obviously, nobody in the workplace is gonna be doing uh, tertiary prevention in terms of preventing deaths, right? Uh, if you are, give us a shout because that'll be the first in terms of those type of interventions. Uh, usually a hospitalized uh, uh, individual is what we're talking about there. Um, but when we talk about secondary and primary prevention, we want to see if we can uh, uh, give you some tidbits uh, as a result of this global perspective that's going to help keep your workforce safe. The biggest issue that we're dealing with in the U.S. is educating our workforce. Uh, and educating our workforce plays out when we talk about both what we're communicating as employers and health professionals, but also what the general population is hearing uh, from social media, from places on high, quote unquote, um, in terms of misinformation. And to the extent that WHO has come out back in September and said, look, we got to do better at managing uh, what they call the infodemic, right? The misinformation around COVID and its health impacts to individuals. Because the misinformation is very rampant and uh, it causes people to uh, behave differently, inappropriately to help uh, prevent transmission. And, and they, they literally are now tracking uh, in, in some ways the impacts from misinformation on health outcomes in various countries. And so we want to point that out because uh, the best thing we can do for our workforce is to focus on uh, giving proper information to our workforce, reassuring them of those things that are going to be key in preventing transmission, as well as giving them expectation about what to expect uh, as, as COVID continues to play out. And so if we break it down simplistically to three factors to keep in mind, uh, it, as you create a mantra for your workforce, it, it is gonna be employee education first, primary prevention, right? Uh, followed by routine testing and case-based testing. That's gonna be a, a really a fortified way to prevent transmission in the workplace. We've talked about this ad nauseum previously, um, but it, it, it's gonna be a staple here well into 2021. And then finally, contact tracing should be uh, uh, tantamount to just a normal uh, act of business at this point in terms of interviews and automated distancing. Those things are not gonna go away anytime soon and should be a part of your repertoire if it's not already, okay? And so we won't uh, overcomplicate the strategies. Obviously, there's nuances to each of these, but in terms of uh, workplace safety focus for your workforce, keeping it simple is gonna be key and letting them know this is gonna be part of the roadmap here to help prevent 
as we take data globally and reduce it down to what are, what's going to be most practical, what's going to generate the most ROI for our workforce in terms of safety, um, and these are it. So with that, we'll pause, we'll hit the question and answer period of our uh, presentation today, and uh, happy to get into it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Harris. Uh, one person asked if you could go back to the slide that um, relates to the treatment that was given to President Trump, the medication cocktail. And sure. while you're doing that, there's one question related to his treatment, uh, which you covered last week regarding the steroid um, that was given to him, but the person wants to know what type of steroid it was because it's only been reported as a strong steroid. Do you have any idea exactly what was given to him? Um, I have to confirm it, but I believe it was dexamethasone, uh, I believe that was given. And it's a typical uh, steroid given, uh, particularly for uh, individuals that are having respiratory uh, immunologic responses to help uh, uh, decrease that response. Uh, the, essentially, your uh, respiratory system gets overwhelmed with um, uh, the immune response and causing, uh, causing it uh, in, in the alveoli difficult to exchange gas right uh, oxygen and so by decreasing that immune response you can improve the ventilation of an individual uh, and so it's a it's, it's something that is commonplace uh, in addition to that the regeneron solution with a monoclonal antibody we did touch on it last week and um, that cocktail has been in uh, uh, phase one two and three clinical trials by this company uh, and they have applied for emergency uh, use authorization at this point uh, with FDA for utilization in non-hospitalized individuals. So it's not a vaccine. There is little evidence, uh, if none, at this point to show uh, if this cocktail can actually prevent uh, contracting COVID-19 if administered to someone uh, prior to. Um, but uh, it, it is uh, something that they've investigated to decrease the symptoms of a non-hospitalized individual um, uh, that has contracted COVID-19. Okay, unfortunately, we're pretty short on time. Um, there's one other question regarding the global perspective and any observations you may have about what employers in other nations are doing compared to the primary tertiary and um, model that you have showed should be applied in the U.S. Um, are there sure. Are there any suggestions you have of things you've observed in multinational corporations or other countries? Uh, no, the strategies have been much the same. Um, but across the board, what we've seen is a focus on testing, routine testing, and getting access to, uh, um, the, when I say valid tests, uh, we want to get access to tests that uh, have undergone some rigor of approval uh, in those respective countries. And we certainly have helped uh, uh, develop uh, multinational approaches at WorkCare for our partners that operate uh, in other countries. And by far and away, though, uh, testing has been something that uh, has, has was started internationally um, uh, ahead of the U.S., uh, really getting into the swing of testing um, because of access uh, to tests that were FDA approved and, and whatnot. Um, and so when we talk about the overall uh, nuanced strategy, there is not a, a lot of variability uh, and there is a focus across the board ubiquitously on testing. Okay, thanks. And I just want to remind everyone, we do have a frequently asked questions document on our website about testing. Um, and if you want to review that and if you have any additional questions, feel free to submit them and we'll add them to the FAQ. And I just wanted to also mention that for next week, we're considering um, talking about herd immunity. And if you have other topics you'd like us to address, feel free to submit them to us, and we'll be sure to incorporate them into future topics. So thanks again for joining us, and thank you to Dr. Harris once again for sharing your expertise with us. Everybody stay safe. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Stay safe. Bye-bye.